Uh, welcome to the Museum of Our Industrial Heritage. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Sheila Domkaler, and I'm one of the partners. Um, I'm wor I work with for one of the partners of the Comptic Valley Memorial Association in um, bringing this, uh, the Crossroads exhibit, Crossroads Change in Rural America, to Turner's Falls and Franklin County. Um, PVMA, Pocumptic Valley Memorial Association, has worked with the Museum of Our Industrial Heritage for decades now, I think. Where's Jim over there? Um, and it's been a really wonderful partnership um, for both organizations. Um, so we were really happy to, um, re we reached out to see if they would be interested in and helping us with the programming for Crossroads, and Jim uh, signed on. <laughs> he didn't know what he was getting in for, maybe. But uh, um, So let's see, I just want to make sure I, I thank all the people involved in, in this program and the Crossroads program. Uh, I want to thank um, John Boschman from Frontier Community Access TV, who's filming this today. So thank you to Jim and to John and and then to our two presenters. Um, so Crossroads Change in Rural America was brought to the Great Falls Discovery Center in Turner's Falls through a collaboration between the Smithsonian's Museum on Main Street and Mass Humanities. So this and other Crossroads companion events, this one here today, have been produced by the Mass Department of Conservation and Recreation, which manages the, the park in Turner's Falls, Friends of the Great Falls Discovery Center, River Culture, Pocumptic Valley Memorial Association, or PVMA, Montague Public Libraries, and New England Public Media. Um, additional support has come from Mass Cultural Council's local councils um, for our, our final Shea program, and I'm gonna list them. It's amazing how much support we got. Bernardson, Buckland, Charlemont Holly, Colrain, Conway, Irving, Gill, Leverett, Leiden, New Salem, Northfield, Orange, Rowe, Shutesbury, and Waitley. So that was a really wonderful response we got from, from all these towns in Franklin County. Uh, partners for the statewide tour were one of six locations that the Crossroads exhibit has come to or is coming to in Massachusetts this year. Um, they include the National Endowment for the Humanities, Big Y, and Blue Cross Blue Shield. The local business sponsor is Greenfield Savings Bank. So, um, yeah, so, so enjoy the talk today. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'd like to introduce you to a very good friend of mine and a good friend of the museum, Mark Fornier. He's done a lot to help this museum grow, restored a lot of the tools that are in here. And he's going to give you a little background on himself and how we got to restoring tools. Thanks, Jim. Great to be here. Thanks so much for coming this afternoon. Uh, what could be better? We're in a mill that was built in, or the original mill was built in like 1689. We're sitting on the river. It's snowing. <laughs> what could be better, right? It's awesome. And we're gonna. And for me, we're gonna talk about tools and wood. So this is a good thing. Uh, I grew up in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, an old mill town in northern Rhode Island. French, back then it was a French Canadian community. I then went to UMass Amherst and studied forestry uh, quite a while ago. And um, always loved trees throughout my whole life. I won't give you my whole career, but um, I love trees. I went to study forestry. I spent four years as a student at UMass, left for three years, went into highway construction, went back to UMass and worked there for 24 years in Amherst and started a lot of the early sustainability programs with teams there. But I've always loved trees, which meant I always loved wood. And that somehow led to hand tools because the old tools enabled you not only to do the work, but also to feel the wood, to see the wood, to feel the wood. You know, power tools are great. We all use them, but you don't really get to feel the wood and see the grain and, and see the different kinds of wood um, like you do with hand tools. So today, um, we're going to switch gears a little bit. It's going to be much more interactive and hands-on. Um, we have a lot of people here, which is awesome. Jim and I were, uh, were, and Sheila were wrestling with, okay, how are we going to do this with, you know, 50 people? So what we're going to do um, is we're, I'm going to talk to you about different types of tools, okay? And we're going to hand them around. I think it's, it might be a little bit distracting, but I think I want you to feel the tools. I want you to see them because the old tools were a combination of beauty and function, right? They were made to last for generations. They're art. They're just, they're amazing to me. I, I, I'm continually astounded with old tools, and that's why 
uh, now that I'm semi-retired, although some people would tell you I'm not retired at all, um, I love to restore old tools. So I want, I keep them from the trash bins and from the scrap bins, right? And get them put back into people because there is a resurgence of people working with tools. You know, you've got Eric in the basement um, as a blacksmith. Um, you got Zach, who's a luthier. All these folks are working with hand tools and with wood and with metals. Um, you got Steve as a silversmith. So, you know, there's a need for these old tools and we really don't want to use them. The other thing that's really cool about old tools is you get to, to work with these old tools that have come through generations and have been touched by, you know, who knows who along the way and they've stamped their names into the sides of hand planes and then to carve their initials into the handles of hammers. So I'm going to show you those today. We're going to go through those, and if we have enough time and you're interested and you're not bored at the end of the workshop, hopefully, um, we're going to go into the exhibit room, maybe in two waves, and I'm going to show you how they um, actually used some of these boring tools and cutting tools and drilling tools and marking tools, um, and how, if I was going to use the hand tools, this is, my, this is an old design of a birdhouse that I make, um, and how we would make that with hand tools. So if we have enough time and you're interested, we can do that, okay? I also plan on uh, breaking down, my, one of my favorite hand tools is our hand planes, right? And we can break one of those down, I can show you the components of that. Basically a, a hand plane is like a chisel in a frame, right? And um, they, you can get the best kind of surface of wood with a hand plane, better than you can with sandpaper, better than you can with anything else. Um, you just, it shows you the grain, you can get amazing smoothness if you've tuned and sharpened your hand planes. So we'll, We'll talk about that after. So uh, without further ado, we'll talk about um, different classes of hand tools. Before I start that, though, I wanted to show you two books. Um, these are my favorite books. They're, they're written by a guy named Garrett Hack. Um, he has a series of books. These are the two that I have. They're amazing. They talk about old hand tools, right? So if you get a chance, Garrett Hack. Um, he's a wonderful uh, person that also loves hand tools and talks about and tells you how to use them how to sharpen them, how to tune them, and what the best ones are. And here's a book he just that talks about nothing but hand planes, okay? It's, this is the best book I've ever seen about hand planes. Uh, I was fascinated, so I know I'm weird. I get excited about tools, but it's a cool book. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about are, are measuring tools, uh, marking and measuring tools, and I'm just going to pass some things around to show you they could be anything from pencils to rulers to squares and to scribes, okay? So, you know, you have your, you know, your, your pencils, right? Any, I, I, I always have a pencil in my ear. It's how I'm known, right? Uh, everybody knows that I had this. Uh, well, during COVID, I had a really big problem. Every time I tried to put on a mask and I flipped it off, my, 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 <laughs> pen, my pencil went across the room. I lost it. It was gone, right? Um, but I love pencils. I mean, you don't have to pass these around. They're wood pencils, and they came in all kinds of different shapes and sizes. You know, you had carpenter's pencils that were flat for marking wide lines, and then, you know, you have the, your standard pencils. So we have those. And now, of course, you have pens and everything else you can imagine. Um, rulers, there's all kinds of rulers, and I'll pass a couple of these around so you can see them. You have your old wood fold, folding rulers, right? Really cool six-foot folding rulers. Okay, so I just pass these around, you guys can feel them. Then you have these kinds of cool rulers, which unfolded like this, unfolded like that, and were spectacular, right? Um, made for like little projects, right? You can see that's, a, that's an old Stanley Sweetheart. Whenever you see Stanley Sweetheart, the Sweetheart logo on Stanley Tools, it's pre-1935, just to give you a sense of what we're talking about. So it's, you know, 90 years old or so. Um, and then, we have um, adjustable squares. Before adjustable squares, we had these guys, which were tri-squares, right? And they were always like, had, came, you know, br you know, brass bound. They had really beautiful decorations. This is a big one. This is kind of, this is very on Carmen. This is a sar an old sergeant. And this is like, I think this is like a 12 inch one. They were usually smaller, so. Pass those around, feel them, and just kind of make sure they come back, okay? Because <laughs> these are all out of my personal collection. These don't come from some corporate headquarters. These are all coming from my, my personal shop. Um, some of the tools I'm going to show you today, many of them, are, are from the valley, right, are from this area. Uh, 
I spent 28 years here. This is where my heart really is. I love this area. It's, you know, it's the birthplace of a lot of the tool companies. Starrett, Goodell Pratt, Miller's Falls, uh, Greenfield Tap and Die. They made amazing tools, right? And a lot of people don't know that. This was really the hotbed for hand tools for many, many, many years. And they made amazing quality here. So this one's a little LS, whenever you see LSS and company, that's LS Starrett, they're out of Athol, right? And this is a baby adjustable square. And these were made to do a couple things, to see if you could get, you know, if you had to make a square line, a perpendicular line. But they were also, if you wanted to scribe a line, you could set it at two inches and draw with your pencil a line along the edge for two inches. This, this one's unique. This one's fairly uncommon. This is Mohawk Shelburne, which was made by Miller's Falls, Miller's Falls, so one of the Miller's Falls line. It was, a, it was one of their economy lines, right? They're still awesome. I mean, back then, economy lines were, were still amazing, right? So there's a, a Mohawk Shelburne adjustable square. You have any questions? I talk too fast. I'm French Canadian. I'll slow down. <laughs> but you have any questions, just stop me, OK? Um, little knives, um, you know, little utility knives. They didn't just make a utility knife in those days. They made it with all these credible designs on it, right? They're beautiful. This one's not retractable, so I took the blade out of it because I didn't want it. But I wanted you to see the handle on this because this is spectacular. It's an old Stanley 299. Huh? Um, everybody know what a framing square is? Yeah. Big framing square? Well, this is a baby framing square. This is just another version. I think this one, I can't remember if this one, this is a Hercules, so this is a Sergeant Hercules. Sergeant made a line called Hercules. It was just, you know, they named, they branded back then. So they made all these cool names to brand their tools. So that's a little Hercules, a little baby framing square. Um, this is just, I won't pass this around, just a straight edge, right? Nice, beautiful straight edge made by um, Starrett. And if I, wanted to, if I wanted to do something like look at the bottom of a hand plane and make sure it was true, I could do this and put it up to the light and see if it was perfectly straight. We want to make sure the bottom of a plane straight because you want to plane the board. But it, that, that one's spec this one's this one's what we call dead on. You can't really see through that. Okay. <laughs> yep. So this one is, and we'll talk about planes in a little bit. I won't pass this around. Well, I guess I will. So let's pass that around anyway. You can see that. Why are your tools cleaned up? Why? A lot of the tools that you see that I've got came from rust buckets. They came out of people's basements, they came out, you know, they came out of junk boxes, they came out of crates of stuff that people give me. They go, Mark, I found this in my grandparents' basement, I don't know what's in it. And so my theory is to, to take anything that anyone wants to give me, and then I'll do a sort. There'll be, a, uh, this is going in my collection, right? This is gonna be restored and donated to the museum. This is going to be cleaned up and given to the ReStore, you know, Habitat for Humanity, Goodwill, those kinds of places. And if it's in really bad shape, then it will go to the scrap bucket, right? If it's too rusted, if it's, too, it's, you know, the parts are missing and you can't reuse it, and I can't use the parts for something else, it goes into the scrap bin, right? <laughs> they usually rust it when they stop. Thank you, Lori. Right. <laughs> you oil them. Yeah. Right. Yep. So, yep. So I, you know, I oil them to keep them, you know, from rusting. But a lot of them I've cleaned up. Um, there's a delicate balance. Some tools you'll see here I have not cleaned because I wanted to keep the original patina, right? But many of the tools you're going to see here I use, but um, and those have been cleaned up so I can use them. But you'll see some in a few minutes that have the original patina on them, and it's a delicate balance. And I try to. Uh, uh, whenever I restore something, I try to really honor the history of the tool. So, so this is a perfect example. So when I was restoring these planes, I restored the metal, but I did not restore the paint. I cleaned it, but I, did, I didn't repaint them. Some people repaint them, that's fine, but I don't believe in that. I want it to look like the original tool. So I don't repaint this, right? I clean it up as best I can to, to really honor it. Um, a lot of what I do with the knobs and handles is I'll clean them and then I wipe them with one coat or a couple of coats of what's called tongue oil varnish. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it really restores the finish and it you know, really kind of um, seals off some places that might have been damaged in the past so that they don't get more damaged, right? And then also so you can use it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's my theory. And you're gonna find that people that restore tools 
the way they do it is all right across the gamut, right? Some people do what I do. Other people take them, they tear them all down, they sandblast them, they repaint them, and they make them look like new but different, right? Um, so if you wanted to scribe a line along the edge of the board, these are little scribes. And what you do is you'd set this block and you drag it along the board and there's a little point here and that would scribe a line, right? And this one's a double-sided one, so you could, if you wanted to scribe six inches on one side and four inches on the other side, you could set this block with these two things, with these two pieces, oh, at, yeah. right? Oh, cool. And you could just flip it over, so you could be, you could be, if you were doing production work, you could be, clo you know, you were <coughs> building something, you could flip it over, so there you go. Some of these tools, uh, you, you heard Steve talk about maker's, maker's marks. A lot of people didn't mark their tools in the old days, which really for me is unfortunate because I always love to know the history of the person. And with Google now, you can Google anything. We all know that, right? And so I Google tool, tool companies and tool names and tool models all the time. And it's fascinating what you can learn about the makers of these tools. Here's another, um, here's another scribe, and this one's got an interesting lock. This is you know, obviously handmade, what we call bench made by someone at their shop, and this is how you get locked. You, know, you slide this, and you, form, you push this wedge down, and it's locked. So you would scribe with that. That's, I love that one, it's my favorite, that's my favorite one. Um, I guess when the tools come around, let's, uh, what are we gonna do, put somebody at the end of the line or something? We'll kind of we'll them you can give them to me. Yeah. Give, yeah, okay, so. And when they come around, either give them, uh, oh good, there's a pile back, there's a pile back of Sheila, uh, you know, whatever you want to do. Oh, okay. I think you can like right here on this chair. Beautiful. Back here. Kind of wood. This, um, you know, so it's really hard to know. This is probably maple, really tight grain, smooth wood, hard, st stable, right? And of course, old wood's better than new wood, right? So the old wood was really tight grain, right? So that's probably maple. Could be beech or maple, but that looks like maple. Um, if you wanted to, if you wanted to copy an angle on something and you wanted to transfer it to a new part, like say I wanted to figure out what the angle on this birdhouse roof was, I would use this angle copier, lock it, and then I could transfer. Right? And this one I can't remember. This one, this one's a Diston. Anybody know what, who, what Diston made? Henry Diston. What did they make? Exactly right. Hand saws. Yep, exactly. Can you so, explain the thing at the back of the saw? Is that a cling now? What is that little knob on Dipson's? No board? one knows. <laughs> Literally. I mean, you go to the, you Google, what's the knob on the back of a handsaw? It's everything you can imagine. No one really knows what it was. Okay. Uh, this one doesn't, but I'll show you a handsaw in a minute. So, clamps. Um, you know, this is, you know, clamps started as wood clamps with wood threads, right? And then they went to metal. When, when metal technology got better and better, we started to cast metal, forge metal, cut threads in metal. That's what, we, that's what they were doing here, right? Greenfield Tap and Die, Miller's Falls. So this is a nice kind of old, cool, beautiful, and I've cleaned this one up. You'll be able to see, right? This one's clean. This was, this was a serious rust bucket clamp, right? But they're beautiful and they work really nice. So that's a that's a steel, <coughs> what's called steel C clamp. Mine China. China, yeah. Luckily that one, yeah. That one, like that one doesn't. <laughs> I think I don't think you'll see anything here that's not made in the U.S. except maybe a new screwdriver or a new clamp. So all this stuff is uh, made in the U.S.A. And then you know where do we go with rulers and tape measures today? <laughs> right there it is. Right. Right? And they have all, this is, has all kinds of benefits, right? Uh, the wood rules, I like the way the wood rules feel, but these are, I mean, these are great. You know, you're going to stick it out like 10, 12 feet and do some really nice measurements. So that's, everybody knows what that is. Um, clamps continue to, you know, kind of transition from wood to metal, and you saw, saw different kinds of, you know, combinations. This is called a Jorgensen, otherwise known as a Jorgie. Right, and so you could you could adjust the angle of the clamp jaws to clamp different kinds of parts, right? And they have wood jaws, so they were soft. They didn't damage what you were clamping, right? 
That's a nice little, that's a nice little baby. Uh, the pin on top of that, what was, is that a scribe? Yes, exactly right. You got it. So there's a scribe in the bottom of the adjustable square. Okay, now we're going to go to striking tools. Don't worry, it's okay. Um, hammers, right? So um, we have the nice old wood mallets, and those we used to, with when you were chiseling. So you'd have an old chisel, and it would have either a, you know, a leather or a wood end in order not to really beat that up, and also you, so you can control the strength of your cut, you would use a wood mallet, right? And actually, they feel really nice, too. It just, it's just a good feel. And you have a lot more control on what you're doing with a wood mallet. So there's a nice old wood mallet. And you'll notice, oops, sorry, I'll, sorry, I'll steal this back from you for a second. You'll notice on all the old, especially the wood tools, there's all these nice little scribe lines. They just didn't give you a block of wood that was round and stuff a, a dowel into it. They gave you this beautiful handle, scribe line, same thing with the head. They just, it was art, right, and function at the same time. There you go. And then you have standard claw hammer, right? Now, the, the reason I brought this one is the, we talked about, you know, Googling different company names. This one is called Cole, Collins Company, and the name of it is called Legitimus. And if you look at the, at the logo, it's spectacular. It's like a little crown with a hammer and an a, a, a arm with a hammer, right? So I always discover these incredible logos on the old tools, right? And the way I clean these up a lot of times is I use a really fine wire wheel and a lot of hand work, but wire wheels with a, re you, have, you can't use a coarse wheel, use a really fine wheel, you can get this kind of patino and not damage the tool. And you can see, so here's perfect restoration job for me, hammers, heads restored, the handle's the same, cleaned it up a little bit, left it, right? It's got the old paint, it's got the old markings, it's got all the old damage from being used for decades, right? So there's a claw hammer. That, and that's called a curved claw hammer. What's this? What kind? What kind of hat? Exactly right. Who said hit shingling hatchet? No, there you go. I should have brought presents, right? I should have brought gifts today. Here's the, no, no. <laughs> so, yeah, right? <laughs> So this is a beautiful old shingling hatchet, right? You could, you, could, you could pull nails, you could drive nails, you could split shingles to shave them down, and it was just a really nice multi-use tool you stuck in your, you know, in your belt, right? So, and, and really beautiful, just, that's a really nice one too. It's got really nice shaped forged head. Um, for pulling nails, Yep. Yeah, you could pull. So if you say you were shingling and you made a mistake, you'd rip the shingle off because usually it was a galvanized nail. It would stick, right? Or it was an old nail. It would stick. It would, the shingle would snap. Well, you'd get that underneath, and you just, you, what you'd do is you get underneath the nail right here, and you'd roll up the handle, right? Okay. Um, and then, sorry to bounce around a little bit, but here's your new kind of clamp, right? So these are kind of cool, actually. Um, this might have been made in China. This might be one of the Chinese ones, <laughs> um, unfortunately. Um, but, um, so these are great because you can adjust it really quickly, um, right? And also it's got rubber, jaw, rubber pads on the jaws so you're not going to damage. So if you're doing work, where's Zach? Is Zach here? So Zach used a lot of these clamps when he's working, right? These kind of clamps, right? And they're easy to use. They're just really fast. We use old clamps too, but you know, these are kind of nice now. So that's a really nice improvement. So you've seen the kind of gamut from wood clamps right up to you know, squeeze clamps, spring clamps. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, the metal clamp that you passed around, is that one that you repaired? It looked like there was a well. It's probably been repaired over the years. I did not. But yeah, a lot of the old tools, because people were poor, they valued the resources. Oh, and by the way, the tools were really good. If something broke, they'd go to Eric and they'd say, hey, I need this welded or, or reforged or repaired. And you know, your local blacksmith or whoever it was welder would repair your tool instead of throwing it away, which is you know, the beauty of the old tools. Yeah. Okay, so now um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about chisels, gouges, gouges and draw knives. So, um, 
this is an old chisel. I've taped these, I've taped these blades because they're really sharp. I, um, I'll talk to you a little bit about sharpen in a little while, but these are all really razor sharp. But I wanted to give you a sense of what the old chisels look like. Um, they're beautiful forged steel. Uh, they have these wooden handles. This one will pull out. Not anymore. Um, and they have nice handles. They have a, kind of a sometimes leather end. And what that did is it protected the wood and also gave you a little bit of give, right, on the end of your chisel. And you could really control, like I said before, the force you're using to, you know, to, to, make, a, to make a notch in the wood, to do dovetailing, to do mortises and tenons. Um, chisels are incredible. And what you're going to see is a hand plane, we'll talk about in a little bit, is nothing but a chisel in a bed, clamped down. Basically, that's what, that's what a plane is, right? So there you go with that one. And a gouge is basically, think about a chisel. It's got a flat blade with an angle on it, right? Got a bevel on it. A gouge is usually curved this way with a bevel on the end. So you could gouge a, like a rounded hole or make a bowl or whatever. So this is a nice little gouge, and you're going to see a maker on this one. You're going to see the maker's mark on here, and it's going to say cast steel, right? And if you want to know about different kinds of steel, Eric, who's the blacksmith in the basement, he can talk. He's the expert on different kinds of steel. So you, want, you have questions about that, he's the guy. Zach's the luthier. you got questions about guitars, stringed instruments. He's the guy to talk to over there. And we're, the nice thing about this building, um, and Jim, you have to give Jim a lot of credit. He's been you know, running this museum for how long now? Right. And, you know, he and I have been friends for decades, and he's really given his life's blood to making sure this mill lives and grows. And now the thing that's beautiful about this building is it's really an artist's center. There's craftsmen all throughout this building. There's artists, right? Um, and it's really amazing. It's what, one of the oldest working mills in Greenfield? I would say so, yeah. Yeah. So... And it's been restored. You know, it could have got torn down. This area could have got developed, and they've you know, prevented it from from that from happening. So here's another. There's a little gouge. Um, if you were gonna make um, a spindle for a chair in the old days, you would use a series of different tools. If you didn't have a lathe, say you took a square piece of wood, you cut it on your table saw, and you wanted to round it, you would use a draw knife. And you would, you would just peel the wood, and then at the ends, you would bevel it down so it would fit in a hole in the chair. So here's a nice little draw knife. This is a, um, this is a Jennings and Griffin. You can see the maker's mark on that. It's got some wood handles. That is not restored at all. That's raw. <laughs> or original. How's that? <laughs> original. Um, another version of a draw shave would be this guy, little Stanley scraper. You'd pull it. has an adjustable blade. Some had rounded blades, some had two blades. Some had a, a rounded blade and a, and a straight blade next to it, so you could do some rounding, you could do some, you know, you could do some straight cutting, some straight shaving. So you can see that. I think, oops, sorry. Yeah, and this is an old Stanley and Rule, Stanley Rule. Okay, and then I'm not going to pass this box around, but um, this is a box of old scrapers, and, you know, for scraping paint or moldings or those kinds of things, scrapers came in kits thanks man with all kinds of different shapes right so you could scrape moldings with all kinds of different shapes right round square concave convex pointed and there's a whole set of of different shapes in this box okay um here's another here's another scraper um, yeah, I'll pass this around because this is kind of fun. Watch out, don't stick your finger inside that because the blade's pretty sharp. This has got a double-sided blade too, so be careful at the top. This is another one, just a kind of nice Stanley number 80, right? And the nice thing about some of the tools is they're marked with the model number, so you can actually go Google them, see what the, see what the period of time was when they were made. Um, and you can look at the logo and the 
logos on them and actually tell from the logos what period of time these tools were made into, especially people like Miller's Falls. Their logos changed dramatically over the years. Stanley changed dramatically over the years. Remember I mentioned Sweetheart? Pre-1935, right? Some of them got dated, some of them didn't. Here's a nice little, that's a nice draw shave. And you just feel these tools and feel how nice they feel. They're ergonomic, they're made to fit your hand, they're not straight, they're, they're usually not rough, they're smooth, they're machined well, they're painted. Some of them are older, so they're a little weird, um, but, <laughs> but they're still good. Um, so now, so there's, then there's a whole series of things called files and rasps, rasps, right? And so this is our little rasp, little Stanley rasp. Uh, nice thing, the cool thing about this is Stanley had a partnership with England. They made a lot of their tools in England for a period of time. So this has the bases, the, 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 the handle is made in the United States, but the cutter is made in England. So you'll see this. That's just a nice little hand rasp. No, no, nothing fancy. Newer. Um, so when I was a kid, I was really close to my grandparents. My grandfather and I were like this. Uh, I spent most of my time as a, as a young person with my grandfather and my grandmother. And he and I were really close. And he taught me what I, what I, uh, my early woodworking skills. And I always remembered for some reason, and he was a machinist. So uh, Jim knows that he was a machinist for 45 years at a company called Taft Pierce in Rhode Island that um, made for many years parts for Pratt and Whitney and other companies like that, small tools and parts. And um, he, he loved to work in wood, too. So he taught me how to build birdhouses. That's why I think that's why probably I like to build birdhouses now. Um, like birds, too, so that's probably got something to do with it. And, uh, but I always remember this. He taught me how to use a file. And to file the edges of wood. I can't understand. I don't understand why that always really, really impacted me, but he always had a file. Probably from being a machinist, how you use a file when you're a machinist, often he used wood files all the time with wood. So instead of using sandpaper around the edges, he'd just file a bevel on the, on the edge of the wood. It was really cool. So this is just your standard, uh, this is a standard, this is a Kearney and Foot, uh, old USA. It's called, it, this call, it's called, ironically enough, this file, file's called a bastard. Sometimes there's flat bastards, there's smooth bastards. <laughs> Sorry, but that's what they are. So this is a, this is a, a flat and rounded bastard. How's that? So, so there you go. And it's got, that's right. And it's got a beautiful handle. So if you notice the handle on that, it's got a beautiful wood and brass bound handle. Now, this tool is cool. This is a, got a file on one side. It, it's kind of beat up. It's old, but I love it because of its history. It's got a rasp on one side, and if you look at this when it comes around, you think about the machining to make this thing. It's, it, I, I, don't, I still can't figure out how they made these things. It's crazy how they made these rasps. But this one is uh, Stokes Brothers. Anybody know what this kind of rasp was used for? Horseshoes. Oh, you guys are all right. I got to bring <laughs> gifts, man. You're ruining my whole show. <laughs> I discovered that the other day. It's amazing, right? They were used for horseshoes, right? And for hoofs, rather. Hoofs, to get the hoof to be the right shape, right? Hoofs, sorry. There you go, right? Yep, exactly. So, um, so this is an old one that I loved. Once I found the history of this, right, I just love that that's what this is for. Feel how heavy it is when it comes around. A thing weighs a, it weighs a ton. Yep, there you go. Okay. Is the rasp just like a heavy duty, more heavy duty? It, it is kind of a rough version of a file. Think about it, right? It's like to really take off, take off more of the material you are working on and leave a rough surface. And you could smooth it out with a, you know, with a file later, or you could leave it rough if it was something you didn't care about, right? Yep. So um, next thing we're going to talk about are hand saws. Um, I'm going to pass a few around. The blades are taped because they were fairly sharp. Um, but in the old days, you didn't just make a handsaw. You made a handsaw with a beautiful handle that not only felt good, but look at that handle. The thing is spectacular. It's just like really beautiful. Um, and if you look closely on this, you'll see um, a really nice logo that's in there. Um, and there were some, 
I sold one recently. It had a bomber, it had a World War II bomber on it. It was made by Distin, and it was a line of saws that had a World War II bomber on it. And um, a lot of times it's really hard to see, but if you, you hold it in the light a little bit, you'll see that it has a spectacular logo as well as the handle is just amazing. So there you go. And um, this one's just a different. The medallion will have the name too. It will too. Yep, exactly. Usually what? Often what company? Distant, you got it exactly right. Yep. In fact, you'll see distant on this one. Did you find out what kind of bomber? Um, I looked it up. I can't remember right now, but it was a World War II. I think it was. Yep. Yep. It was spectacular. It had a, you know, it had clouds in the bomber. It was, it was just amazing. It was very faint because, in order to clean these saws, because they're usually rusted to heck when you get them. Um, you know, it takes some of the logo off, but a lot of that but a lot of it stayed. So this is, um, if you looked underneath the blade, I'm gonna untape the base of this. You're gonna see the teeth, and then I want you to tell me what, what you think it was used for, and it comes around. You can read, oh, uh, let me do this so you don't get hurt. What do you think that was used for? Can you see the teeth on that? A rip saw. Actually, it, it is a kind of a rip saw, but it's not. Rip saw would have the heavy teeth, right? Yeah. So a cross cut would have fine teeth. This one's different, what is it? Yeah, what do, yeah, I love trees, right? It's a tree saw. It's one of the old original tree saws. Cause it's see the, handle for that too. Doesn't it? It's got a beautiful handle. So I'm gonna tape that back up because it's pretty sharp. Um, the clean out, right, exactly, right? So what so you'd see a bigger groove, right? In between in the teeth every inch or so, and that would clean out it would clean out the saw. You're right. There you go. There's another beautiful handle, some nice brass work on that. How am I doing on time? Okay, good. Um, could be here for three days. Sorry, guys. Um, anybody who know what, what kind of saw is this? Yep, box, could be a miter saw, box saw. It's also called a back saw, right? Because when you're cutting dovetails on the corners of drawers, you want it to have your, your blade stay really stiff and straight, and that let you do it and you usually cut in a shallow making a shallow cut so that would help you and this has got a spectacular handle on it too this might be a distant and you also find those in miter box like this exactly correct yep yep and you'll see some of those out out in the, i think there's one in the in the exhibit room and then what kind of saw is that is that spectacular it's a hacksaw but it's actually a special hacksaw you know to you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Dentist, right? Yep, yeah, they did. Yep, they, what they call the doctor saws were called bone saws, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> but but you know what this is? It's a watchmaker saw, uh, or a clock, you know, clockmaker saw, basically, right? Jewelers. It could be a jeweler saw too. Yep. Yeah. Check that out. That's spectacular. Really beautiful. Look at the handle on that when it comes around. Um, and then saws changed, or, or saw, saw technologies changed dramatically, especially in the tree profession. Anybody know these? Does it cut on the pull or the push? It's on pull. So the old saws you pushed, right? These guys cut on the pull. Did they originally come from Japan? Yes. Yeah. Japanese style. In fact, I'm going to show you. So I'm not going. I'm not going to pass this around because I, it, it, I mean, it's basically a, this is a, basically a folding pruning saw. They're spectacular. You ever want to do pruning? Take a class first because you can't glue it back on a tree. But um, these are the best kinds of pruning saws. Okay, good. Talking about Japanese saws, and I'm not going to pass this one around either because this is like deadly sharp. Um, these things are amazing. Yep. This, this is a, a Japanese, basically a pull saw, right? Uh, on one side, remember we talked about crosscut and rip? Rip on this side, crosscut on this side. You can make spectacular flush cuts with these. It, it's incredible. You can make dovetail cuts. They're, they're amazing. This technology is amazing. This one's got a, got a way to actually adjust the angle of the handle too if you had to get into a tight spot, but they're beautiful. Isn't that crazy? Yep. I think they call this one. Steel is so thin. The steel's really thin, right? You make a really tight kerf, really small, uh, narrow cut. 
um, but they work. They're amazing. This one, actually, ironically enough, this one, I'm not going to pass it around. It's called a razor saw. So gives you kind of a sense of the tool, right? Anybody bored yet? No. Okay, good. 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 <laughs> uh, and that's, that's my daughter, Abby, in the back there, and her mom, Roberta. So Abby's here. Hi, Abby. <laughs> You're not bored yet, Abby? Good. <laughs> So can you replace the blade on this? You can. You can make your own blade, basically, is what you'd have so to do. Already you could get you could, can you get another one in? Yep. Right. Some of those you have to kind of play with it. It's not easy. It's not like the new ones where you unscrew it and you can pop the blade out. You'd have to make a saw blade. Basically snap a saw blade, drill a couple of holes and, and re and rework it. But you can do it. Okay, so next, um, we're going to go to screwdrivers. Sounds kind of boring, but they're not. Um, screwdrivers in the old days looked like this. I have a whole box of these. I got them in a, at a yard sale. Um, it's, this is ornamental. It just, and Eric will see this. this I, th I believe this is, it might be forged. I, I'm not sure. Um, but I mean, think about that. Look at the handle. Look at the brass work. Look at the, right? And it, this was for, you know, dealing with big screws, right? And I bet you these guys also used them to, as a, like a crowbar, right? To lever, right? To wedge things, to open things up. So check that out. Really nice old screwdriver. Yeah, exactly. Here's a, um, here's a smaller version of that. And this one's a Stanley. It's actually marked, right? This is a really cool little, real, little Stanley, right? Oh, God, I don't even know, late 1800s maybe, somewhere around there, yeah. mid to late 1800s. There you go. Unfortunately, a lot of these aren't dated. You know, you can, you can, you can research them, right? But they're kind of all, a lot of these are all over the place. Um, this was, uh, this, so as you can see with tools, there were innovations throughout the years. Every, you know, all these um, manufacturers in order to market their tools and come up with innovative ways to use them and to sell them, they came up with all these crazy ideas about how to make them better. See that? Can you see that? It's got little wings on it so you could really grip it and you could give it a real twist. And this one, and, and of course they had to name it, right? So it was cool. Anybody know what this is called? It's called Perfect Handle. <laughs> all right? <laughs> Right? There you go. They only made one. They only made one. That's right. That's right. So um, you have those. Then you have, here's a Miller's Falls. You're going to be careful with this one. It's even got the original decal on it, right? This is a ratchet screwdriver. Right? It's so cool. And you basically went like that. Right? Yeah. Right? That's what they used. Now, of course, now that we have all the new technology around bits, thanks, Bill. Um, now I hate spade bits, right? Because they slip off the screw. Because now you can get all these great, you know, socketed bits, right? That won't slip off. But this was the way they did it before, and you know, I'm sure those guys swore too because that they, they would they'd be making this beautiful piece and they use this thing and we go and drill into the wood, right? But they worked really well too, right? Now we have Phillips heads. Like Phillips. What's that? The first part of the school is these are That's right. There you go, right? There it is, <laughs> right? And it's reversible, right? So it's cool. It's got a little lock, so you bring it down and you lock it, right? But I'll, sh I'll pass it around like that. It's, it, this is a, it's a really, and this is, um, sorry. So this, one in, it, this one's a Miller's Falls, and it's a, it's a five, se 670A. And Jim knows, and Scott knows, that there's like <coughs> about a thousand models of ratchet screwdrivers in Miller's Falls. Man. And we, we were trying to figure out which ones are we going to keep. And it's like 670, 670A, 672A. It's crazy. But they're, what they're, years did they make those? I don't even know. Do you? When did they start? It's probably, I would yeah, think. Pratt made them in his 20s. Yeah, I was just going to say 1920s, something like that. And, and then they, made, they continued to make them for a while. Um, now, now, Goodell Pratt, there's one over there, it's called, 
hold that thought for just a second because it's got a great name. So Goodell Pratt made him, it was called the automatic screwdriver. And that one is 1870. I think that one's 1870. So that gives you a sense of when that kind of thought started. Right. Is the Yankee the same thing? The Yankee? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Early. And, Early. Yep. And then of course, okay, sorry, China. But <laughs> These are great screws. This is one of the best ratchet screwdrivers you can get now because all the tips fit in the handle and they have almost every tip you can imagine. And you don't have to carry another box around. You just have your tips in here and you can, like this one, they're, they're double-sided tips so you can switch it from Phillips to slotted. Goes both ways or you can stop the ratcheting. So these are pretty cool. Double-sided, yeah, here. Yep, yeah. So you, so you got double, double the tips, right? So um, that's screwdrivers. Now, the, one of the fun, so we got two major, two major um, categories left. And one's boring tools. So not boring as in <laughs> I'm going to fall asleep, but uh, boring tools, right? You catch the drift, right? Not exciting. Ig not exciting. You got it. So, um, you know, Drill started in the old days. I mean, you could, you could basically start with bit, br let's start with bit braces. There were things before bit braces, but bit braces, I forgot the bit brace. Can you get one out there? Can you get that one off the bench, please? Off the rack? So we started with bit braces and basically it was a handle and you rotated it. It had a double chucked, double, it had a double chucked jaw that you tightened and Jim's going to get it out of the other room. Um, this is a brand new set of bits, which I'm going to show you in the other room if we have time. And it had an interesting chuck to fit this kind of end, right? And it, it, gripped, those, it gripped those drills. This, this set actually is brand new, never been used. It's in the box. Check that out. Isn't that amazing? I mean, huh? Chrome, yeah, never, never, never taught, ne basically never used, right? Thanks, man. Perfect. So, my faithful assistant, yeah. or I'm his faithful assistant. I'm not sure. It depends on the day, right? <laughs> so basically, you had this chuck, loosened it up. There's your bit, right? It was usually an auger bit like that. It had, a, it was an interesting cutter, and you basically. Tighten that. It was a two-jaw chuck. They became three jaws later on with drills, regular drills. And basically what you did is you went like this. And some of them, like this one, had a, basically a directional control. So it would ratchet this way, right? Or you flipped it the other way with this little control here, and it would ratchet the other way, right? So you could, you could... Right? Right? Like that, right? And you, you'd hold it and you'd put this down and you'd ratchet it around. So that's, a, that's called a bit brace. This one is a Miller's Falls, right? Uh, and it's probably like a 10 inch. So there's, your, there's a bit brace. Do um, you want me to pass this around? Do you want to see this? No. no. Everybody goes, no, no, no. <laughs> okay. Um, then. It got really cool. I just bought this at an auction. Oh, wow. This is a That's corner amazing. bit brace. So if you had to get in a corner and you, couldn't, you didn't have enough room, you would do this. Oh, Throw your bit in. Isn't that crazy? Oh, so this thing, it's a little tight because it's old and I got to do a little work on it, but basically you would go like that. And that's how you... Isn't that cool? Now I'll pass this around because this one's really cool. Yep, yep. So, so then they got even more interesting. So say you had to go into an angle, you would put this in the end of your bit brace, and then you would put your bit in there, and it's got a, basically a universal in it. You twist this, and it would turn that drill. And they had some that would adjust. Like this one out to, well, um, this one was stationary, but they have some that have angles on them. I mean, you look in the exhibit room, we've got a bunch of those out in the other room. Have you ever researched the patents on those things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so then, so then, we affectionately go to egg beaters. Remember, right? So we went to egg beaters. This is a restored Miller's Falls. Um, cool thing about this one is, the bits are in the handle. 
They got smarter and smarter. These guys were always thinking, right? Bits are in the handle. So this has what you would think of as your standard three-jaw chuck now. It's a standard drill chuck, right? And they're just, if you feel this, it's just really nice. This is a newer one. It's got a plastic handle on the side. I wanted to bring it on purpose. They started as wood, but later on, as materials got cheaper and there was more pressure to compete with other companies, they tried to, they tried to change and, and save on material. So this is a, there you go. So is the plastic handle on the side in case you have three hands? So it, so it, well, actually what you do is sometimes you would go like this if you wanted to, right? So it, yeah, yeah, you'd need three hands, right? Yeah. <laughs> It is a little confusing, but a lot of times if you need it to stabilize and you could lean against it, that's what you do. There you go. That's a Miller's Falls number five, or 5A, I think. Um, and so, you know, there were, there were different, like, versions of those. Like, everybody was trying something different. So, everybody said, this didn't work out so well because you really... <laughs> It wasn't really, you know, but it was, you know, it was just, a, it was a good try, right? And this is a Dunlap slash Craftsman, right? Um, yeah, so here, I'll pass that one around too, just because it's kind of cool. It's different. Um, you remember we talked about Benchmade tools? So in the old days, a lot of guys, if they were in the machine shop, they couldn't afford a new drill, they would make their own. So this is what's called a breast drill. You would, this one you'd literally have to lean against. You were, you know, you're drilling it like a beam or something like one. You would be like, and this is bench made. This is literally made by a machinist somewhere. He looked at, he or she looked at, you know, uh, somebody, you know, somebody who had made one commercially or somebody down the street who had made one and they, uh, and he made this. I'm assuming he, or it could have been she. It could, it could have been she, but. Unfortunately, someone made it, right? So this thing, I won't pass it around. It's a little, you can come up and feel this later. It's, really, it's a little bit um, oily because I kept it lubed because I didn't want it to rust and I, I, want, I needed to lube it to make it work. But this is a cool, it's a cool breast and this is like serious, right? And um, there's a name, kind of a name on the chuck, but I'm thinking that um, somebody bench made the rest of it and put, and put a commercial chuck into the end of it, right? So... This breast drill, yep, it's a breast drill. Now, um, the other thing uh, for, for bit braces, before I forget, they made these things called expansion bits, so you could adjust them, to, right? So you could adjust them for different size holes, right? They're, they don't work as well. They get a little weird. They're a little hard to use. If they're really sharp and you got exactly the right hole and a white kind of wood, they're kind of okay. Um, but it's called an expansive bit, this is the Miller's Falls, right? Made here. Number 48. Yeah, for basswood, exactly right. Now, this is one of the coolest bit braces, and this is out of my collection. This is a Miller's Falls. It's a breast drill. So first of all, it's got a level in it. So when you're drilling, you could drill straight, horizontal, right? Um, it's got really cool handle, really nice handle, a nice chuck. Um, if you wanted to adjust your leverage, Right, got a longer handle. If you're in a tight spot, you rolled it in, right? So, right, so there you go. And then the other thing, that the, but the butt, or and, the coolest thing about this one, it's two speed, right? So you got this, you ready for this? You're not gonna believe this. You press a button, you take that out, you put it in the other hole, it catches a different gear. So the first speed catches that, this catches that gear. Now, you got a different speed. And if you wanted to change your speeds because it wasn't working on the material, so all you did was go like that. Right? Cordless variable speed breast drill, right? <laughs> think about that. I mean, those guys were amazing, right? Think about it. It's like crazy, right? <laughs> um, this is earlier. I'm looking at the logo. So early 1900s. It's a 12. It's Miller's Falls. So this one's Miller's Falls. It's got the earlier triangles going on, the embedded triangles. So what do you think? Early 1900s. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Turn of the, cent the turn of the century. What's yeah, yeah. This one's made this one made Greenfield. Is there a separate name on the bit on the bit? 
No, um, so on this one, there's no name on the chuck. So this is all made by Miller's. Okay. Um, a lot of times, like you're talking about, you can, you can tell who made it by looking at the chuck. This one, they use their own chuck. You know, a lot of times, it's, these are also um, Goodell Pratt, right? Goodell Pratt's another local manufacturer. There's some spectacular ones out in the, out in the displays and out in the exhibit room. So there's a breast drill. So that, that's a cool tool. So is the variable of different densities of wood? Yeah, or metal. So you want a faster speed, you want a slower speed in metal and a faster speed in wood. Just works better. Or different kinds of wood. Or different kinds of wood, right? Right? Size of the hole, right? Size of the drill, size of the hole. So you could just adjust to what you need it to do. Okay, so I know I don't want to run out of time and I don't want you guys to get bored. So, uh, hopefully you're not. So, hand planes. Hand planes, I could spend three days talking about hand planes and we wouldn't be done, right? Um, hand planes, there are so many hand planes that have been manufactured over the years in so many styles. Um, it's, it's amazing. Hand planes started as basically as wood blocks. Hey, Jim, can you give me that coffin, that coffin plane out of the other room? That, that one on the shelf, please? Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, they started as wood, and they had a metal cutter, right? And a wood wedge that held the metal cutter into the body, right? So those were called wood planes. Then over the years, they transitioned to, ironically enough, a transition plane. And you basically had a wood, bot, be, you had a wood bed, you had a a metal frame on top of the wood, and then you had your metal cutter and your metal, your metal cap. Um, so here's how we started. Thanks, pal. So here's how we started, and this is, a, this is Greenfield Tool, right? Mm -hmm. This is a Greenfield Tool, um, and this has actually got a Greenfield Tool cutter in it, which is pretty unique. Um, these guys, people who are making planes, a lot of times use Sheffield cutters from England. So when I'm talking about the cutter, I'm talking about this guy, right? Right? And we'll talk about the pieces in a minute. And so you had that steel cutter. You had this wood wedge that held the cutter in place at the depth you wanted it to be. Uh, and so this is a nice, beautiful wood plane. Now, this one's called a coffin plane. Anybody know? <laughs> right? Right? Looks like a little coffin. Right? So there's a, there's a coffin plane. So we went from this to this. As, as technology changed and we got better and better at working at metal, now you've got this stable metal frame over a wood base, which may or may not, may not be stable based on temperature, humidity, et cetera. They tended to crack if you didn't treat them properly. So this is, this is, kind, this is a cool one. This is a Stanley Liberty Bell. And I'm going to pass it around. You're going to see that it has a Liberty Bell on the, on the cap. It was one of their lower quality planes, but it's beautiful. Right? You've got a place for your hand on the back. So this is called a tote back here. That's called a knob up front. And so you could hold it, right, well and stable. You, you could be really stable because you really want to have a lot of control when using a hand plane. So there's a Liberty Bell. So then um, there's different versions, of, you know, from different companies, from different countries. This is from Germany. This is a wood plane, and it's called a horn plane. Right? And these smaller planes are called smoothing planes. So um, hold that thought for a little bit, for a little while after. So this is called a horn plane. And I'm going to pass this around because if you look at the woodwork, there's inlay on this. It's incredible. It's a, there's an inlaid base that was, that was basically adhered to the bottom of this base. And you got this really beautiful tote in the back, knob in the front, which is a horn on this one, right? And it's, this is from Germany. It's called an Olmia. So that comes out of the personal collection too, and that has not been restored. That's original. That's you know, that's this is raw, right? I find it's easier to have control with a knob where your hands on top and the knob versus the horn where it's on the side. I, I do. I like, I like this yeah. more, right? So, so, um, so bench plane. So now, so next we we go to um, iron planes. This is when metalworking became really good. We got really we got much better with uh, metalworking. You got a you got a cast base, cast iron base. You got steel cutters. You got a steel cap. You got wood knob, wood tote, which is the handle in the back called a tote. 
All right, and so the pieces of the plane, I shouldn't take this apart because I had set up the cut, but maybe it'll be okay. Um, so you've got the bed, you've got the tote, you've got the knob. This, this ironic, anybody know what this is called? It's got a great name, what's that called? Look at it from the side, it's called a frog. <laughs> okay, because it looks like a frog, right? This, this handle here is called a lateral adjuster, so it went back and forth to adjust the angle of the blade in the, in the plane. Um, this is called the cap. And then this assembly is called a cutter and a chip breaker. So you've got the cutter, which is the iron that's kind of like a chisel, right? It's like a big flat chisel. And on top of it is screwed. You can see a screw in the back. It's called a chip breaker. So what this is meant to do is it cuts the wood, and as the wood peels up, the chip breaker gets snapped off, right? And, what, and the chip gets snapped off. And what, when you're cutting, you want to be cutting the wood, and you want to be kind of snapping it off too. But you want to keep that width of your mouth of your, so this is called the mouth, right? of your plane, you want to keep that narrow as possible because if it's too wide, what happens is it tears the wood, right? As you cut, it opens up too much. So if you keep that mouth tight and you got this good chip breaker going on and it's adjusted perfectly, basically you're breaking off these little, little pieces and it's a much smoother cut. And it's a whole nother day's talk about how these work. But this is, but this is an iron, right? And a chip breaker, right? And, and, and then on, on this, you have this adjusting wheel. See this right here? And that adjusts the, the blade up and down, back and forth for depth. So you can see with these, these became much easier to adjust because on the other one, you had a wedge, right? You had a wood wedge. You kind of put the, kind of put the iron where you wanted it, and you bang the wedge in, but it might move, right? And there was always, they used to bang on those. They actually, some of them had a knob. You bang down with a wood mallet, it would, it would adjust the cutter a little bit to get to where you wanted it to be. Um, you're going to notice on most of these that you're going to see here, we set them on the side because I don't want the blade to get hit. I don't want, so you'll sit them on the side or you'll see us sit them in a special rack that, that's made, tool rack that's a, it's called a, uh, a plane till. That you'll see we made one in the exhibit room. So this, so... Then, now we're in iron planes, right? They're, in, they're different sizes. They're called bench planes. These are, most of these are called bench planes. And they come in different sizes, right? They come, there's the smoothing planes, which are the shorter ones. Then there's jack planes. There's four planes. There's uh, jointer, plane, jointer planes. They get bigger, right? So I'm going to show you a few different sizes, and they're all meant for different kinds of work, right? So if you're working on something really small, this is one, this is one of my favorite planes now. This is a Fulton number two. Uh, and look at that baby, isn't that beautiful? It's just a, just a pretty little plane. So this is made by Miller's Falls. And back in the old days, um, the makers that made these planes, they made them for a lot of other companies. So this was made by Fulton. It's actually called a Fulton 3708. But after that, it says BB. So BB meant it was made by Miller's Falls, right? So, so the cutter has a BB on it, and so does the, so does the base, right? right? So this is a Miller's Falls plane. The other way you can tell that it's a Miller's Falls plane, where's my, anybody get that little screwdriver kicking around over there? Anybody see that screwdriver? Yeah, yeah. So the other way you tell a Miller's Falls plane, and I'm, I'm just showing you this because all the makers had these kind of little tricks and little uh, tricks of the trade. It's going to be hard to see. Can you see those little lines there around the base? The only company that made a plane with a base that had those ribs in it was Miller's Falls. That was the only, they, was the only company that ever made those. And it kept the knob from turning. And they, I think they felt it kept it more stable. And they used top of the line woods from all over the world. They did, until later. <laughs> later, they started to use some... Not so good wood, right? But you're right. They made, they used, you know, rosewood, uh, ebony, all kinds of amazing wood, right? So this is a number two. This is a spectacular little plane. It's just a beautiful, 
You'll find a lot of times with tools that are smaller, they're more valuable because people love them. Little wrenches, little screwdrivers, they're just like amazing. So I'm not gonna pass this around because it's got a really sharp blade on it, but if you wanna come up and see it after, come check it out. So that's the number two. So Stanley planes, everybody uses Stanley planes as kind of the benchmark for size. So you'll hear about a, a number four, a number two. Um, Miller's Falls, however, had a whole different set of numbers, right? So um, this one is called a 3708, and Miller's Falls are kind of smart, but then they got a little weird. Um, this is a little, this is about an 8-inch plane, so 3708, okay, the 8, it's an 8-inch plane, but it's got 370 in it too, so is it a 7-inch plane or an 8-inch plane? But a lot of times they had planes like a 900 was a 9-inch plane, it was a smoothing plane. Uh, uh, like a 714 was a jack plane, which was bigger, which is kind of, it's like a 14 inch plane. Um, so we went to different sizes and I wanted to bring you a couple of sizes. If you want to see other planes, you can go in the exhibit room after, okay? But this is a number eight, Stanley, which is 24 inches. This is for, you know, smoothing floors, big, big long boards that you want to have a, s a really smooth edge when you want it to put them, you know, join them together. This is what you use. You didn't have a joiner back then. This was your joiner plane, right? Right? So that, there's a, that's, this is a Stanley 8. And this is a really old one. The old planes, remember I showed, told you it had a lateral adjustment on that little plane to move the blade back and forth to angle it? These were called pre-laterals. This is a 1870 or so. This is, a, this is an old plane. This is a beautiful. 1870? Yeah. Yeah, spectacular. And, and talk about nice wood. You can come see this after. The wood is, like, amazing. In fact... In fact, I'll pass this around if you want to check this out. Just feel that. I mean, the thing is, wow. it's brutal. <laughs> but the good thing about heavy planes is they did a better job, right? Because they were really secure. They held down to the wood. You know, you, you had to be strong. You had to set your body in the right place to do it. But they did a great job. Um, um, so different kinds of planes. Anybody know what kind of plane this is? Block plane. Often these were used for doing the edges of wood on small jobs if you wanted to, you know, clean something off really quick. Or this is what's called a low angle. It's like 15 degrees instead of 25. Um, these were doing end grain of wood. So this like really cuts really well. And you can, on this one, you can adjust the mouth really tight. There's a little adjustment on here with a lever where you can adjust the mouth to be really tight. And you, you cut end grain with this plane. So, really, and this is a cool, this is a little Miller's Falls 56B, so let's, let's see what that means. It's six inches, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's a 56B. Um, it, there's, a, there's a kind of a theory between us uh, folks that have been studying Miller's Falls. We think that those guys were like up in the boardroom some nights, like having some drinks and went, and we were joking with each other and they were kind of half-baked. And they were like, what are we going to number this plane next year? <laughs> and they figured out some new numbering system because no one can figure it out, right? You know, it's, it's funny what you were saying about feeling the wood. I took, I took a master class with a guy that studied the crown. Yep. And he wouldn't know what to do with a, with a cast iron plane like that. Right. Uh, his first class, they give you a piece of steel and they teach you how to make your own Make your own plane, plane right? <laughs> yeah. It's an art, right? It's an art. I, I, these happen to be my favorite just because I love them because they're so intricate, you know. I, I love them. And I, I, brought a, I brought a Stanley number four <laughs> yep. plane in. You didn't know what to do with it. Right. Yeah. Well, this is a whole art because the frog's adjustable, the blade's adjustable, right? You have to make sure the bed's yeah. smooth. So in order to make this work properly and not have chatter in the blade, if the frog is not adjusted exactly to the right position in the mouth, what happens is the blade goes like this. And when it starts to chatter, you don't get a smooth cut anymore. So the frog can be either too far forward, too far back, right? Your cap on these, it's really nice because the caps on these are really close to the, to the end of the blade. You get really good support. On the newer, cheaper planes, you don't get that kind of support. They kept cheapening up the material. They kept making the cap smaller, smaller, smaller. Then the bed was smaller, smaller, smaller. They machined out areas to save metal and to save weight. Right? And they became cheaper and they didn't do as good a job, right? So this is, a, this is, what's that? I was wondering if 
wondering what happened to Miller's Falls. If all these well, were so good, where so, are they? Well, so Miller, well, it went the way of everybody else, unfortunately. Um, Miller's Falls made good, no, made planes, bench planes from 1929 to 1969, so 40 years. Then they got bought out, and guess where that went? They went overseas, and then it, they became really bad, you know, poor quality planes. I call bad, poor quality planes, and they went out of business. Basically, you get some investment company that breaks them up into pieces, sells off the parts, and they go away. So that's why you don't see Miller's Falls anymore, unfortunately. I bought a plane in Harbor Freight once. Yeah, no. <laughs> no my, uh, we won't even go there, right? <laughs> you shouldn't even step into Harbor Freight, right? <laughs> Not even for a screwdriver. <laughs> so what was the multi, the multi uh, everybody was after it over the years, the multi, it came with all kind of uh, multi. Shop Smith, you mean? No, no, it was a Stanley number something, but it had. Oh, OK. So. So, uh, <laughs> this is a Stanley combination plane. So you can make all kinds of different moldings, different shapes, and what it did, it has had, it's, it's, it's beautiful. This is called a 45, they made a 55 also. But it's, um, it, I, I, can't, I won't take it out now because it takes too long, but basically it's, it's an amazingly ornamental plane that was made to cut all kinds of different shapes and adjusted to all different kinds of shapes. The problem with them was um, they worked, but they were really hard to use and get used to. And when you had to sharpen those cutters, it was tough. Because now you got a curved cutter that's got all these kind of weird shapes. So you couldn't put it on a flat piece of glass, right? Um, it's, uh, it's, so, so that's what you're talking about. Yep. You, were you going to ask a question? I, I actually was going to ask about sharpening the blades. Because, okay. Uh, we're we're going to, yeah. Because it's a, a fine it's an art. art. And, yeah, uh, as you I, probably know. I know the Japanese craftsmen have a separate category of people who just yeah. sharpen blades. Right. Yep. Yep. And I'm going to talk about sharpening in a couple of minutes. Everybody still awake? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is a scraper. Uh, it's a Stanley 12 and a half. You would pull it. It's got a cutter. It's got a flat scraper, but this, is, it's called a cabinet scraper. So if you were scraping wood that had like burls or different kinds of grain that was really hard to, to scrape or plane, you'd set this, and, and, and the blade on this has a, has a little burl on it, which is a little curl. So it actually, cut, it's, it, I haven't even figured out how to do it yet. I'm going to go to a class to figure out how to sharpen scraper blades, because you sharpen it, and then you basically round the edge off a little bit, so it has a little hook. And what it does is when you got all this varying grain, you're pulling and it's giving you a perfectly dead flat um, finish. Yeah, this one's pull. And then this one, you'll notice, I'll pass this one around because it's kind of cool. It's got a lignum vitae base. It's got an amazing wood base on it that's really stable and smooth. Um, anybody know what this is called? <laughs> It's like a rocker plane, right? There you go. That's a good name for it, actually. Um, it's called a com compass plane. It's a Stanley number 113. And what you did was you could cut convex or concave shapes. So you turn this, and it would change the angle of the bed. Isn't that crazy? That's amazing. So these guys were thinking. And this one, I mean, this, this is old. This is 1879, I think, maybe. Isn't that cool? I'll pass that one around, too. When you changed it, would remain a radius? Yeah. Huh. Yep. A little difficult to use, but, uh, but you know, this would take, it's a number 113 compass plane. Does the value of these tools, these antique tools, go up with age? Um, yes and no. It, it varies. It's, like, it's almost like a commodity. Depends sometimes, on the person. Sometimes <laughs> a person, you know, like you get nut, nutty people like me that love them, yeah, yeah. Um, they're worth more. Um, and the value goes, kind of varies based on what people will want to do on that particular time. You know how um, you know how community farming's come back, you know, local farming, CSAs, for a while it went away, nobody wanted to do it, they want to do local, local farming or anything, it's all come back. It's kind of, these kinds of tools are similar to that, right? So, any other questions about tools? The collectors that like to look for molding planes yeah. of all sorts. Right. Of shapes. So there's a whole 
you know, I mean, you keep, molding planes, the, the volume's gone really way down now because there's so many of them kicking around, but the w old wood molding planes, each one had a different shape. And some of them were, you know how you have tongue and groove boards? You know, there's a, like a little dimple and there's a groove in one and a dimple in the other one. There were planes that cut, you know, the grooves and, the, you know, the tongues and the grooves. There were ones that cut all kinds of different shapes of moldings, right? So the, the, um, unless you get a maker that's really well known, like there's a one particular maker that they were talking about at a tool um, conference at Old Deerfield last summer that I was at. Um, in fact, those folks came here for a tour. There's one particular man who, um, he was a black man. He worked as an apprentice for another person and he actually made really good planes out of this old guy, this other guy. And then later became known, and unfortunately, you know, it was, you know, there, those times, um, the black folks weren't really appreciated for the work they did, right? Um, and so his planes now are worth thousands of dollars if you can find one, mm -hmm. literally, which, which is good and bad. It's a shame that, it, that they weren't valued more then, but it's also really good now that people are starting to recognize that and appreciate it, right? And so, so those planes are worth a lot of money, but your typical molding planes are kind of, mm, kind of, you know, they're okay, but not a big deal. Uh, the, the old wood molding planes. Um, now, any more questions? So we have a large group. If you want to, we're going to move into the other room and we can, I can show you how we sharpen a blade um, if you want. Anybody want to do that or you all had enough? Yeah. Okay. See how you Good. So any, anybody who wants to come in the other room, we're going to go in the other room. We're going to set up the wheel really quick. So thanks so much, you guys. Really appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Thanks. <laughs> Come in the other room if you're interested and if you have time, okay?